Thanks for dialing in uh, today for Castle's webinar on a customer preview of Castle Safe Spaces, a blueprint for how America can return safely uh, to their work in their offices. My name is Daniel Lin. I am the CEO of Castle Systems. Today, I'll be sharing the mic with our Chief Product Officer, Todd Berner, who'll be doing the bulk of the lifting for the presentation. Uh, let me highlight, uh, if I can, on this next page, the objectives that we have for the session today. From our count, we have a little bit over a thousand attendees on this webinar, which I think is the largest webinar we've ever hosted. It speaks to the level of uncertainty and interest, I think, around this topic, and hope to be able to provide you with good blue blueprints as we develop your, as you develop your uh, return to work plans. There are four things that we're looking to accomplish today. As I started the, the webinar, uh, we at Castle are in a really privileged position, working through and with industry and technology experts to establish a reputation and expertise on technology, on systems and on processes and how they all work together. That's inherent in the way that we take our managed services business model approach. We'll draw on that expertise to share our point of view on how to safely and confidently return the workers to the buildings. As customers, uh, you already have a great head start through our access and control relationship that can help with some immediate support in getting back to work. We'll remind you of some of those opportunities to make sure that you're aware of them and taking advantage of them, but also share with you some of the new features that we've got developed and will continue to develop with our Castle Safe Spaces launch. Third, uh, we'll be discussing a framework for integrating technology and process solutions that really can be customized to support your objectives. We have a set of approaches that we will review that range based off of your existing infrastructure, your resources, your physical constraints, and really can flexibly apply to a broad range of needs. And lastly, this is one webinar, and, and our hope is that, that this is not the end, but rather the, the beginning of a dialogue with you about how we can be helpful and whatever the challenges are that you're looking to tackle. Let me just hand it over to Todd, again, our Chief Product Officer here at Castle, to frame the problem that we set our minds to solve. Thank you very much, Haniel. So, you know, as Haniel said, the question that everybody is wrestling with right now is, is how do we get back to work? How do we do that in a safe way, and how do we do that in a way that gives people confidence to come back to work? And as, as everyone rightly knows, there's a lot of challenges to that. You know, if we start in the upper left, we're unsure who's sick and who has immunity. We don't have a lot of testing right now. And so there's a lot of uncertainty around what somebody's health status might be. You know, the, down in the lower left, widespread testing isn't really available. So right now we're, we're struggling to know really how widespread is this? And therefore, when can we start to bring people back safely? Now, third, it's going to take some amount of time to develop a vaccine. And so whether that's 12 months or 18 months or a little bit longer, there's gonna be some window in which we're gonna to have to figure out a solution before there's a vaccine to bring people back safely. And probably what makes this most difficult of all is the fact that people can be contagious before they show symptoms. And so, you know, all of those things are reasons why there's a lot of anxiety and question around how are we gonna bring people back safely? And so that's what Castle set out to solve. That's what Castle set out to figure out is what is the framework for safely bringing people back to the office? A castle, as, as Haniel said, is uniquely positioned to try and help answer this question and to create this framework. Because of Castle's national reach, 3,600 buildings, 1.3 million cardholders, 41,000 businesses that we uh, secure on a daily basis, having that breadth of coverage allows us to see so many different scenarios and allows us to test as we think about what possible solutions could be for bringing people back to the office to make sure that it's going to work across each and every one of those settings. And the second thing that makes Castle uniquely situated to solve this is because with Castle's integrated system where we control all of the components from the access control system itself to the mobile app, to the visitor management, to the notifications, we can very quickly evolve and create new solutions as situations and uh, dynamics change. So, with all of that, as, as we've talked to experts and talked to different customers and, and spent a lot of time internally, what we determined is there are four different things, that we, four different pillars that we're gonna need to have in place as we think about going back to work. So actually, I'm gonna start at the bottom here because access control plays a foundational role in all of the things that we're gonna talk about here today. And in fact, uh, in just a moment, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about things that you can use your access control system that you have now to bring people back safely in ways that you may not have thought about it, you know, even as recently as a month ago. So we'll spend some time on that. But as we think about what is it gonna take to bring people back safely, it breaks down into four categories. So first is screening in and screening out. As Haniel said, 
you know, we can imagine a world where suddenly it's going to look a lot more like an airport and in the lobby as we think about making sure that whoever comes in has been verified to be healthy and safe that day. Uh, second is touchless everything. You know, just imagine you know, your previous days where getting from the street to the elevator to your tenant suite, how many different surfaces you needed to touch along the way. And so we believe that everything is going to move touchless and we're going to talk across the presentation around how Castle is equipped to help uh, companies and buildings make that shift. Third is around social distancing. So uh, you know, everyone knows we need to stay six feet away, but how can we use technology to help enforce that? And finally, contact tracing. You know, there's a lot that we will do to make sure that our employees and our tenants are safe as they come back to work, but we should be prepared for the situation if anybody is exposed to the virus that we can know who might have been exposed and have ways to, to get the word out to those affected individuals. So intentionally, it's set up to be things that you may have been familiar with, but we're going to talk about where access control and video surveillance plays a role that perhaps people may not have expected. So. Before we get into the, the pillars themselves, I want to share a little bit of data that we gathered uh, as we were doing some of this investigation, because there's a lot that we can and will do as employers and as buildings to help bring people back. A lot of processes and procedures we'll put in place, but part of successfully bringing people back is going to be helping them understand what we have done, the communication part of it, the change management part of it, so that they have the confidence to come back to work. So we surveyed more than a thousand workers in the last week of April to understand what they're going to expect as a, as a thing that's going to make them want to come back to the office. So here on the left-hand side of the page, start with a little bit of data. So here's how you read the chart. Uh, we asked people for each of the different categories three to rate it in three ways. One, is it a showstopper? Without it, you're not going to come back to the office. Two, is it a thing you'd like to see, but you're unsure if it's technically possible? And third would be the item isn't important to you. It's not going to factor into your decision-making process. So the black bars represent things that are, rep that are showstoppers. And just a couple things that I'll highlight here. You know, there's been a lot of conversations, and rightfully so, around the importance of uh, hand sanitizer, of cleaning wipes as people come back to the office. And we saw that in our data as well. If you look at the third set of bars, you know, about one out of every two people said it's going to be important for them to have ample supplies of hand sanitizer and, and cleaning supplies before they come back to the office. But what's interesting is if you look at the two bars to the left of it, and those represent situations where, you know, somebody who is known to be infected is not allowed access to the building or the space, and even somebody who is showing symptoms isn't allowed. So here we see that nearly seven out of 10 people are saying that they're not going to feel comfortable coming back to the office until they know that there's a procedure either at the building or at the tenant level to make sure that only healthy people are coming in. So that's the, the kind of the importance of that screen in and screen out concept, which we'll get to. If you look towards the right-hand side of the, the graph, you know, these are the places where people rated these items as important, but they're unsure as to whether they're going to, to be possible in a return to work. So things like doing on-site testing for the sick or only letting people who have the antibodies come in those scored pretty high in terms of people's desire to see them. They just didn't know if they'd be possible. And the last thing that I'll note is the, the largest red bar represents making elevators and turnstiles and restrooms touchless. So really high interest from uh, our worker population, but a lot of uncertainty as to whether that's possible. So we'll spend time today sharing with you how that can be made to be so. If you look at the graph on the right-hand side, we, we want to double click into this just a little bit and get a sense of what's the single most important thing that people are looking for when they come back to work. And so if you look at the second and the fourth bars, they represent things that you would expect. They represent frequent cleaning, they represent availability. So clearly these are things we will have to have in place before our employees and workers will feel comfortable coming back. But once again, you see that the on-site screening is the most important thing. If they could only have one item, you know, nearly a third of the people said that that would be the single item that they would want to have. So some interesting data that supports uh, the conclusions that we drew in terms of what is it going to take to get people back, but also some interesting uh, observations for you as you think about your communication strategy and your change management plan to bring people back into the office. So before we get into the four pillars, let me just share with you a couple of ideas that we've been sharing with some of our clients in terms of how you can use your existing access control systems to enable that safe return to work even if you don't implement any of the other ideas that we're gonna talk about here today. 
So first idea that we've been recommending to both buildings and to tenants is to use your access control 24 seven. So some buildings may operate during business hours with the front lobby uh, unlocked. Some tenant spaces may do the same thing during business hours. As we think about bringing people back into the office, it's gonna be critically important to know who was in each space, when did they arrive, and ideally even when did they leave. And so by having the access control enabled 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that gives us a very accurate count of who was in that space, both so that we can manage the capacity, but also so we can do contact tracing if ever needed. Uh, the second thing that we've been working with a lot of customers on is using the existing data that we already have around historical traffic patterns within your space. So whether that's the building arrival times or the tenant suite, we already have a lot of information that you can use to help inform what is your reopening process going to look like? When were the, their peak travel times? When were there the largest number of people who were in the space? So that you can begin to think through what can you accommodate and, and what should those thresholds be as you think about potentially staggering people back into work. The third thing we've been sharing with customers is a lot of people have said they're thinking about a staggered work schedule. Maybe it's one team works for a week, then another team works for the second week. And there's a lot of policies that companies are considering as they think about bringing people back to work. The thing to note is that your access control system can be the enforcement mechanism on that policy. So once Castle knows which of your employees or tenants should be working in a space on a given day or across given hours, we can make sure that the credentials work at the times they should be in the space and don't work at other times. Uh, and last, uh, there's a part of what we're helping customers with is move towards that touchless environment. So Castle Presence is our mobile app, allows hands-free access into spaces. And so that's become a, a very popular uh, and timely consideration that people have as they think about how are we going to bring people back to work. So, you know, for those of you who are already Castle Presence customers, you already have this uh, available to you. For others, uh, something for you to consider as you go. But we wanted to make sure that, that we're leaving you with some very tactical and very practical things that you can already do because the access control platform you already have is an incredibly powerful platform uh, that can do a lot of things even before we get into some of these new ideas that we've developed across the last few weeks. So now let's talk about the, the first pillar. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna share with you what we think the end state looks like, and then also what we think is probably more realistic in the near term. So what we're showing here on the screen is what we think the end state is going to look like. So when there is widely available testing, either for the virus itself or for the antibodies, uh, once a person has recovered from the virus, we expect that the world is going to begin using those capabilities to determine whether somebody should be granted access to the space or not. So let's just kind of walk through the examples. So first, there probably will come a time when there are sufficiently available and sufficiently inexpensive tests that we can test people as they enter the building. And that's an important point because, you know, when you are testing for the presence of the virus, you have to test every single time the person comes in the building. So even if you were tested in the morning and left for lunch, you'd have to be tested when you come back again. And that's why the availability of both widespread testing and cost-effective testing will matter before we can implement something like this. Now, second idea is that there's been discussions at the federal level and at other levels of building a centralized database of people who have had the virus and now therefore have the antibodies and potentially have immunity from getting it again. So sometimes it's been referred to as an immunity passport. There's other names that have been given to it, but the idea would be that these individuals have uh, gone through the virus and now represents a, a low risk individual to come back to the space. So as and when those kinds of databases are created, CAS will be ready to bring that information into our system to use that to help inform whether somebody should get into the space or not. In the third scenario, we could imagine that there are places either there's antibody testing or other testing that becomes accepted and reliable as things that can be fed into our database, into our access control system, to ensure that the cleared individuals can get into the building, whereas others who don't have that uh, sort of seal of approval can't get in. And last, there may come a scenario where individuals are sharing that data directly with CASEL and using that as a way to give those individuals clearance to enter the building. Now, as, as we think about this world, there's a lot of public health questions, there's a lot of ethical questions, there's a lot of privacy-related questions. And so CASEL is working with experts in each of those areas to work through those issues 
I mean, one important thing would be there always has to be informed consent. Anybody who's presenting that information has to know how it will be used, uh, how it will be stored. And so from a, a vendor perspective, the thing that we're thinking about and designing for is what's the smallest amount of information that we can hold to ensure the safety of the building while guaranteeing the privacy for the individuals. So there's a lot of questions that are gonna have to get sorted out here and, and we're working actively with experts on this. But we wanted to share this as the vision of where we expect this to go because already Castle's beginning to build towards this, this future state. But with that said, there's not a lot of testing available right now. You can't, it's not easy to get tested for the presence of the virus and the antibody testing that exists right now, I think there are some open questions as to the reliability of those things. You would imagine over time that the sensitivity of those tests will get better. And so, you know, the, the mechanism by which you implement this will be a function of how those tests have evolved. But I think the important point is the, we need to make sure that in a world where we are trying to do testing at the building, people need to be tested each time they're coming in to whatever extent the testing is going to allow us to detect things to give us the greatest likelihood that we are preventing people who are infected from coming in. It may not be perfect, but it's the if, if we're trying to move towards the greatest probability of ensuring that people inside are healthy, then that's the approach you're gonna have to take. Yeah, just for everybody else's benefit, there are a lot of questions on HIPAA. Hopefully Todd was able to address some of the privacy issues. That, that is certainly a thing that we have to work around, uh, make sure that we're not collecting and holding uh, private information that uh, wouldn't make sense for Castle to hold. So yeah, so that, that absolutely, absolutely right. Because the 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 important thing is going to be communicating to individuals how the information will be used and even what is being stored. And so as Castle has thought about how we're going to store this information, we actually do not intend and have no desire to store the health information itself. What we want to store is the access control piece of this to say are you allowed in or not? And so in each of these scenarios, one, two, three, and four, we'd have to work through with, if there are partners involved, we'd have to make sure that when the information is gathered, that it's gathered correctly, uh, and that it, the appropriate expectations are set with the people who are sharing the information. But then at the castle side, what we want to know is, can the person come in or not? Not whether they had a temperature or they had a virus or whether they had the antibodies. So uh, trying to, as, as to the greatest degree possible, keep health records out of the system so that we're allowing for people to come in and out as needed while maintaining privacy and, and health record. So if this is, is where we, we think things eventually go, you know, the, the question becomes, what can we do until testing is widely available? And so this is a, a representation of how we think screening will work in the near term before testing becomes widely available. So Every building is gonna be different. You know, here we're showing a lobby. All of what we're gonna discuss here would hold true with a tenant suite as well. But we've, we've tried to show what we think this is going to look like as we start welcoming people back into the office and back into the building. So we'll start actually in the lower right side because an important thing, if we, we think back to some of the survey data we were sharing before, but even just you know, our own expertise, being able to restrict people that we know are sick is a critical first step in the process. So if we know that somebody has been diagnosed with COVID-19, then we should, be le we should be restricting their access credential to make sure that until they have gone through the full cycle of the disease and have uh, become no longer contagious, that they're not even possibly allowed to come back into the space. So then the next step says, okay, for everyone else where we're unsure, we don't know whether they're sick or not. If you look at the upper left, we imagine there's going to be checkpoints that are set up uh, that will do some screening. Now, what that screening looks like will probably vary depending on the situation. You know, you may have somebody who is a guard who's doing a temperature check, or you may have a thermal camera that somebody could look at to detect their, their temperature. And you may have a set of screening questions. Um, you know, you wanna make sure that they don't have, they're not on a, a restricted list that they shouldn't be allowed in that day. And only once all of those things have been validated, would you actually enable that person's credential for the day and let them into the building. So what we're trying to show both on this page and across the entire presentation is the range of the possible. These are all the things that could be done. Now, each building may choose or office may choose to implement some of these things. So some people might say, 
we'll do a temperature check, but we're not gonna do screening questions because we wanna get people through quickly. Some people might say, we only wanna do screening questions. Whatever makes sense for your specific situation, CASEL can work with that result and then would be able to make that go, no go decision for the individual. But eventually, if we look to kind of the right-hand side of the page, we do imagine that as testing becomes more broadly available, you're still gonna to have to do testing in the lobby for people every day who haven't been shown to have the antibodies. So if, if we don't know their health status, we're gonna to have to verify and re-verify that every time they come into the building. The one thing is, as, as we've thought about this that we think is gonna be pretty important uh, in implementing any kind of screening process or testing process is going to be, how do we manage the volume of, of traffic through both the lobby and into the suite itself? So one thing that we've been working on is to say, if, there, if you're going to implement a series of screening questions, rather than waiting for people to have to get all the way to the office, could you give people a mobile app where they could fill out some of those screening questions ahead of time and then head to a fast pass lane? So either showing that yes, they passed all the screening questions, if that's all there is, or proceeding immediately to a temperature check if there was going to be uh, that as part of the screening solution as well. So, you know, really trying to think through how do we move people through the process as fast as possible while still ensuring the greatest likelihood that we are screening people out uh, who are or who are might who might be sick. Then looking towards the top of the page, we've had a lot of conversations with buildings and tenants around the need to provide personal protective equipment. Some people have said it's the building's responsibility. Some people have said it's a tenant's responsibility. Some people have said it's, it's an individual uh, worker's responsibility. But we wanted to share with you what it could look like if you were going to distribute some of those kinds of uh, equipment within the lobby space itself. And then last, uh, there's probably going to be in the near term a need to have somebody or some process that's managing the capacity within the elevators. So if you think about maintaining safe social distancing, elevators are probably gonna be the most difficult place to control. Um, and so we wanna make sure that they're in the near term, that there are people involved to make sure that we're ensuring the greatest uh, safe social distancing that we can. What we've represented here is what it could look like in the lobby. You could imagine that these same kinds of, of processes could exist within the tenant suite itself. So if we look at this graphic here, rather than those front doors being the front door to the building, those could be the front door to the, the tenant suite opening up into a reception area. And you could, depending on the space, set up one or multiple screening stations there. To the question around whose responsibility is it, I think that we, we've actually in our conversations heard multiple answers. We've heard some people say it's the building's responsibility, some people say it's the tenants. I think ultimately it, it requires a conversation between the buildings and the tenants to figure out what's going to make the most sense given the mix of tenants in the building, the size of those tenants, the volume of traffic that you have to get through, uh, any of the places where you have natural choke points. So I, I think the most important thing is if the conversations haven't begun uh, between some of the buildings and some of the, the tenants within it, especially some of the larger tenants, probably very good conversations to begin to get a sense of how are they thinking about it because it's a partnership. We're gonna have to make sure that both sides understand how the other's approaching it and make sure that collectively we've got a solution that makes sense for everyone. One of the things we wanna spend just a, a brief moment on is around thermal cameras and temperature checking because as people have thought about how they're gonna implement screening in the near term, I think it's, it's widely acknowledged that testing is the ideal way to go about doing that, but until we have tests that are widely available, the, the question then becomes what technology exists today that we can use to gather some objective data that we can use to determine who should get into the space or not. And so as, as we've been designing things, as we've been coming up with solutions, we see probably three different types or three different ways in which you might use thermal cameras as a way to add that additional screening layer as to who gets into the building. So one would be on the left-hand side, the high throughput system. So here you would have a, an overhead or a, a camera that is monitoring an area and it's monitoring for body temperature within that area. So rather than forcing people to go go through one lane. You can watch a wider area, therefore more people can get through. And then a guard could be watching for anybody who's showing an elevated temperature, or you could even connect it into the access control itself. So if you have a choke point like a turnstile or an elevator, you could actually restrict access for that individual. So 
here the approach would be we want to add in a little bit more screening capability but we don't want to slow down or impede the flow of traffic and that high throughput system that overhead area screening camera might be the way to do it in the middle we've seen or we've come up with scenarios and, and solutions for a situation where somebody says i'm willing to take the trade-off of a little bit more of an impedance of the flow of traffic because i want to have more certainty around who that individual is and around what their temperature status is then on the right hand side you could also apply this concept at the tenant suite so you could have it set up where before the temperature check occurs the access card doesn't work and it's only once the temperature has been validated to be below uh, the threshold that the person is let in so we can tie the access control and the thermal cameras together to have that be a condition for somebody getting in now i will say on, on thermal cameras they are not perfect you know they, they have a margin of error in terms of the temperatures they can detect i think it's depending on the camera usually about a half a degree fahrenheit but it's a thing that we're getting a lot of questions on and so wanted to share a point of view in terms of if it is a thing that your situation merits consideration uh, that it's a thing that we can enable as a way to add in an additional layer to a screening process until tests become more widely available so that's the kind of the, the screening in and screening out process we'll turn for a moment to the the touchless everything concept so here, I want to highlight three things for the touchless lobby, and in just the next slide, we'll talk about what it looks like at the tenant suite. So first, it's going to start with how do we make the how do we make the perimeter doors to the building touchless? So in terms of things we can do today, we're already in conversations with customers around taking any door that already has a motorized door opener on it, like an ADA compliant door, and changing the wiring on that so that when a credential is presented the door automatically opens so that the person doesn't have to open the door with their hand. And that can be a physical credential or a, a mobile credential so that they don't even have to get near the reader itself. So not only are we seeing people begin to reuse the existing hardware they've got, um, we've had a lot of inquiries and a lot of conversations with customers about installing motorized door openers on doors that don't have that at all. And so you know, I think there's gonna be a big push towards looking for ways to avoid people having to touch doors at all and that's a thing that castle can do today you know then the next thing as you move into the lobby is going to be how do we handle visitor processing so right now today castle can set it up where a pre-registered uh, individual so somebody who received a meeting invite you added castle at uh, visitor at castle.com to the meeting invite automatically is authorized in our system automatically receives a qr code and when they check in at the front desk with that QR code, that credential is activated and they can get into the elevators and into the suites. So today we already have that capability. Now, some people have said they still want some sort of a validation at the security desk that the person is who they say they are. And there's things that we can do to even turn that part of the process touchless. So we think this is gonna be something that, that visitors and tenants will expect as part of the visitor process. And last is around the elevator itself. And so right now, there's been a lot of inquiries across the last two weeks in particular around how do we make elevators touchless? And not just destination dispatch elevators, but all elevators. Uh, how can we make both the floor call button as well as the floor selection button inside the elevator uh, touchless? So we've been in active discussions with Otis and several other elevator manufacturers to bring that capability into Castle Presence. So we are actively developing that right now there's some work that the elevator companies have to do to make this possible but they're committed to doing it uh, and there's some work that castle has to do but in in relatively short order castle presence the mobile app will be able to not only open doors hands-free but to be able to select floors within an elevator without having to press any of the buttons within the elevator itself so that one is is a little ways off but active development and, and coming pretty soon so then when we get to the tenant suite, you see a lot of the same things. So you, you've got the ability to use motorized door openers with a mobile credential or even a physical credential uh, to open the door without somebody having to open it. And actually one thing I forgot to mention before, the motorized door opener would be used not only for ingress, but also for egress. So when you're going into the space, probably have to present a credential on the way out it could be set up to present a credential which we would recommend because of the additional occupancy data that it gives you 
but if for some reason that wasn't uh, appropriate for that situation, we could install a hand wave reader in front of that door to be able to open the door, to activate the motorized door opener so that nobody has to touch that door. And so, you know, part of the conversation we've been having with customers right now is within the tenant space, which doors make sense to install that? Are there, you know, doors like the front door or maybe an, an IT server room where you still want to have uh, access control, but you want to make sure that you're turning that surface touchless at, to the greatest extent you can. And then same thing with visitor processing. As we mentioned before, Castle's got the ability to make that touchless today. Um, so, you know, that capability already exists. Another capability, though, that we want to highlight that becomes an opportunity of the tenant suite, which really isn't as appropriate for, for the perimeter doors, is a solution that Castle's had for more than 30 years, which is what we're calling no door access control. So here, what we do is we use motion detectors to determine when somebody has entered a space. And just like a door, there's still a reader, still a credential they have to present to come into that space. But rather than turning the door motorized, we can just take the door off entirely. So you, you get kind of the, the best of both. You get the ability to know who is in the space and to still have access control on that space, but to not have a door at all. There's no question of did the motor break, um, just the ability to go through and to, to have a more open plan but still have access control. So that's another solution that in a world where we're looking for touchless surfaces, Castle can do today. So Hanyal, any questions on the, the touchless experience before I, I move over to social distancing? No, there's a, there's a bit of a chaser one from the page before, so I'll ask it now. Uh, are there protocols limiting number of passengers in an elevator? That was one that just came in from the page before. So what, what we, as we've spoken with, with experts on this topic, I think the consensus is that in the, in the beginning, it's going to be uh, manually limited. So you'll have you know, potentially a guard at the elevator making sure that, for example, no more than four people get in the elevator and that they stand in the corners of the elevator. So it's probably process at the start. Um, actually, on the next page, we'll share a little bit around where we could imagine it becomes a little bit more technology driven. But at the start, it's, it's going to be a process probably managed by both the passengers in the elevator, but also something like a guard or a property staff who's going to help enforce some of those restrictions around elevator capacity. Uh, there's also a question here that came in about uh, bathrooms and kitchens. Mm -hmm. So here, I think, again, it depends on the configuration of the space. We'll, we'll dictate a little bit of what the solution looks like. So if you think about uh, airport bathrooms, usually they're configured in such a way that there's no door to that bathroom and you walk around a wall before you get into the bathroom itself. Um, you know, if that is the setup in a given building, that may be a candidate for the no door access control solution. So you can still have the access control, but you take away the door entirely and there's still privacy afforded because of the layout of the bathroom. Uh, in places where that's not uh, appropriate, given you know, whatever set of circumstances, the, the touchless door concept of installing a motorized door op opener um, can be the way that you could accomplish that as well to, to make that surface touchless uh, without removing the door entirely. Yeah, there, there, I think a couple questions lumped together just to get further clarification on the, the doorless door, the doorless opening door. Um, so uh, will everyone need a badge and even the door is opening or open for a previous employee? I think that's a it's sort of applied but slightly different. Um, uh, there's one here, let's see, uh, how does it actually work, the hand wave, how does that work to get in and get mm -hmm. out, what happens if you uh, violate the protocol, does it sure. be on the lights, there are a couple of questions around that. Yeah, so let me explain it in a little bit more detail. So the, the way it would work is that, you know, kind of imagine your typical door where you have a door reader, except in this case there's no door. The expectation would be that as the person approaches that reader, that they, they badge into that reader, whether it's with a mobile app, hands-free, or whether it's with a physical credential. So if they've badged in, then the motion detectors know to expect somebody, and that person can go through. If, if the person doesn't badge in, the motion detectors will pick up that individual once they cross into the space, and there'll be a, a, a little, a, an audible alert letting the individual know they forgot to badge in. So it's not an alarm, it's not you know setting off uh, with the equivalent of a fire alarm, but it's an alert to let the person know they didn't badge in. So 
the alert goes off, oftentimes they would go back and, and swipe in and everything is fine. But the way the system would work is if the person doesn't go back and badge in after some period of time, that after some period of time that will trigger an alarm just as if the door had been forced open. So that's the way in which it's going to work. Um, and so I, I think that answers the question around what happens if somebody forgets to badge in. So there's a, there's a reminder first, and then eventually it can go into an alarm state and all of that can be configured. Yep, great. All right. Thanks. So switching to social distancing. So here, if we kind of start on the left-hand side of the page, there's some conversations that are gonna to need to take place between buildings and tenants to think about how do we bring people back in the volumes that we can handle, especially in the early days. So, you know, as we think about, we'll talk about tenants first. Already, as we've had conversations with our customers, a lot of tenants are considering not only a reduced schedule to come back into the office at the start, but even for the reduced people that they'll bring back, thinking about staggering those schedules. So that there's a team A and a team B, and maybe they alternate weeks. Um, as I mentioned before, access control can uh, play a role in helping enforce those policies. So if your company is thinking about implementing those kinds of policies, you know, let's make sure that we're uh, enabling and enforcing those from the access control side. But then there's also, you know, as we think down the road, we could imagine a world where arrival times may become scheduled. So you may use an app to say, I'm gonna try and arrive at this time. And you know, like taking a restaurant reservation, there's certain slots available. You know, right now, I think there's probably in the early days going to be low enough volume of people that we can handle it without an app. But as we start thinking about getting back to 60, 70, 80% and beyond occupancy, we may have to think through how we stagger arrival times to make sure that we can move people through in, a, in an orderly pace. But then there's another component to that, which is we have to think about visitors. And so here, this is another place where I think it's important for buildings and tenants to begin having conversations now to think about what is our plan going to be for visitors when they come back? You know, should we take a posture that says, for the start, we're actually not going to allow visitors so that we can make sure that we can accommodate all the tenants that need to come back? Or should we begin limiting the number of visitors who can come at the early stages so that we can process the number of people through? You know, here there's, there's no right answer. Every situation is gonna be different, but it's an important conversation to be having between the building and the tenant base so that there's clear expectations around the safest way to reopen the spaces. As we kind of move around the slide, a lot of conversations we've had talk about having floor markings as a visual reminder around what safe social distancing looks like. Whether those are stickers you place on the floor and use it as a branding opportunity, whether you put stanchions in place, the idea is everyone knows about the importance of six feet social distancing, but the more reminders we can create in the space, the greater the likelihood that people uh, respect that social distancing requirement. You know, another thing that, that we're working on right now and, and very close to being able to roll out is having cameras that can actually count people in space. So here, what we'd be able to do is to say, where's an area we're monitoring, Based on the size of the area, we know how many people should be in that space. And if we see that more people are in that space than should be in that space, we can send a notification either to the guard, to the property manager, to the office manager, whoever the right individual would be, to let them know that there's a situation occurring where social distancing isn't being practiced so that action can be taken. And we can also imagine a world, and this is this is further off, but and we talked before about elevator capacity probably being controlled in the interim by a human being. As we get uh, better at counting individuals and knowing occupancy in a building and occupancy in an elevator, the camera itself can partner with the elevator to be able to say the elevator is at the capacity that has been set and we're not going to accept any new passengers until somebody gets out. Further afield, but we imagine that the world is gonna evolve in that way. Uh, you know, in terms of the, the elevator piece in the interim, while we've got somebody managing it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a small idea, but it's an important idea that we even need to think about how do we load people into an elevator. So if we're going to have four people standing in the four corners of the elevator, we actually should load them in a very specific way. We should have the people going to the highest floors get in first and stand in the back. People going to lower floors get in last and stand at the front. That way you're minimizing the number of times people have to cross paths with each other. 
and thereby even in a, an elevator car, which is a difficult environment to maintain social distancing, you can still try and get the greatest spread uh, that is possible in that area. And then last, uh, you know, we think, as we mentioned before, it's important to have better occupancy data for every space, whether that's the building, the tenant suite, even conference rooms and meeting spaces with inside those areas. Understanding who those people are, when they were there, when they arrived, and when they left becomes very important as we think about maintaining safe social distancing, as we think about contact tracing. And so, you know, these are things that, in addition to whatever readers you may already have in your system, we could install new readers either for checking into a space or for checking out of a space to give you greater visibility and greater control over where people are and when they were there. And then finally, there's a series of ideas around contact tracing and how we can leverage the data that exists in the system in the event that somebody ever were determined to be infected and then being able to let other people know that they might have been exposed. So you, you've probably heard in the press the importance of tracing and testing, tracing and testing, going back and forth. Access control, because of the data that we already gather just as the course of our normal business, is an incredibly powerful part of enabling contact tracing. And so this is why I mentioned before, it's, it's very important to the greatest extent possible to ensure that you're using access control 24 seven, both for entrance and for exits. Because in that world where you've got everything set up 24 seven, you know with certainty who came in, who left, when they were there and who else was with them. And that is an incredibly rich data set as you or as you, you work with uh, public health officials to be able to do the contact tracing so we can know who may have been exposed and who may need to be isolated or quarantined uh, because of that exposure. So we can do all of that with access control data. Some additional things we're working on right now is being able to leverage video data to be able to augment that. So right now, some of the things we're working on is changing our video cameras so that we can not only identify that there's a person in the frame, but being able to identify very quickly through search all the places where individuals came together in uh, may have crossed paths. So it's an additional data set that you could use to say, we noticed that two people were together for a very long period of time. All things equal, there's a greater risk of infection than in a situation where two people just cross paths very briefly. So looking for ways to bring additional data sets to that conversation because tracing is going to be an incredibly important part of getting us through uh, the, the coronavirus pandemic. Then next, you know, as we think about the importance of tracing, there has to be a communication platform. There has to be some way to get the message out, either if there's been a situation in the space that we need to, to alert people that they should leave or that they need to take some other precaution, uh, having a way to do real-time alerts, but also having a mechanism to reach people wherever they are. So you know, most companies already have communication platforms like you know, Outlook and Teams, Slack, there's lots of different uh, mechanisms, but you know, with through Castle Presence and our Castle Alert offering, the ability to have a mobile app where communication can be sent out in real time and can have two-way conversation when appropriate uh, will be an important part of bringing together and, and sharing information as it becomes available. And then last idea around contact tracing here is there, because of the data we're gathering, there's an ability for us to perhaps do a new level of quality control on our vendors, and in particular our cleaning vendors, than perhaps we've thought about doing in the past. And we saw you know, from the survey data and even from the conversations that I'm sure many of you are having right now, cleaning is top of mind for people as they think about coming back to the building. And so with access control data, we can know when did they enter and when did they leave so that there's a first layer a kind of understanding of did they spend enough time? You know, if you see that it should have taken an hour to clean a space and they finished in 20 minutes, it's an occasion for a conversation to say, why? Uh, why, why, did, why were we able to finish so quickly given we'd expect it to take more time? We can even take it a step further, you know, through the addition and use of any existing cameras that are already there. So a service that Castle has around remote video guarding or patrols, we could actually be monitoring those cameras on a regular basis to ensure that as the cleaning crew moves around the space, that there's somebody monitoring to make sure that yes, indeed, they're in the space, they're doing the things they're supposed to do. So those become additional ways that Castle may be able to help 
as we think about ensuring that the cleaning is taking place at the level that everyone wants and needs to feel confident coming back. As we sum up here, we talked about the, the importance of the four pillars of the safe return. So there's the screening in and screening out. You know, using the powerful access control system you already have in partnership with testing or screening results to make sure that we're doing everything we can, you know, even before the availability of widespread testing, to make sure that everyone who is coming into that building is as safe as we can make it. Now, second, we talked about the importance of making everything touchless, whether those are the front doors, whether that's the visitor processing, whether that's the elevator itself, or even in the tenant space, thinking about removing doors entirely, the more surfaces we can remove, the more we can enable people to leverage a mobile app to be able to open doors without having to touch them, uh, the greater confidence people will have to return. Now, third, we talked about social distancing and the importance of using technology to both manage the times at which people arrive, but also manage and monitor the occupancy in a space. So we're ensuring that people are practicing safe social distancing and we're enforcing the policies that both the buildings and the tenant suites have established in terms of people coming back into the building. And finally, we talked about the importance of contact tracing. So while the first three things are all about how do we keep people as safe as possible, the last one is in the event that, that somebody is determined to have been infected, how can we leverage access control data and video data to identify which other individuals may have been exposed so we can speed the time to where we can identify those individuals and prevent them from potentially infecting someone else. I'll turn it over to, to Hanyal to kind of wrap us up here. Um, thank you uh, all to, for spending the hour with us. As I said in the beginning, we hope that this is a way to start a dialogue with all of you and how we can collaborate to support your uh, effort and your journey in getting your um, stakeholders back to work. Uh, a lot of what you saw today is available right now that we can already do based off of existing technologies. Some of it is work that is underway, as Todd said, that is under development, but should be uh, work that we're, we're working towards in the coming weeks or so. Um, if there's anything that we can do to help you think through some of the problems and, and opportunities and challenges here, do not hesitate to call. We really appreciate the support and, uh, uh, and, and relationship that we have with our customers out there. So thank you again for dialing in today and uh, please do stay very safe out there. Thanks everyone. Thank you.